morning, church. Happy Time Change Sunday. Isn't it awesome? How many would like to do away with that? Woo, yes. All right, let me ask you all a question here. Have you ever, be honest, okay? You're at Potter's hand, safe place. Take the mask off. You're safe here. No judgment zone. God's word is good enough to do the judging, right? Have you ever convinced yourself that it was okay to buy something you didn't really need? Yeah, look, thank you for that hand up. Look at this honest people. Yes, I see that hand. All right, good. We'll have the, let's just have the altar call now. We'll all confess this. I think we've all been there. Maybe we saw like our neighbor had something in his driveway and we said, ooh, I got to have me some of that. Or he had his brand new El Toro John Deere in the backyard and we said, got to give me some of that. Maybe we saw something on their hand or on their neck or something. We said, man, and, we, and that, that eye of envy came up. We said, that looks awesome. I need some of that. Or maybe you just convince yourself you deserve it. Or it's been a rough week. And we have a rough week. What do we need? We need retail therapy, <laughs> right? After all, you've earned it. it. Ain't nothing but a little shopping can't cure. Besides, you deserve it. But here's what happens. The moment fades, and when we get home, that object that we just had to have has already lost not only its value, <laughs> but it's lost its luster. Just a little bit, right? So what do you do? You think, you know what? I'll just go get something else. It's a cycle, right? Like, well, this has already lost its thing. It's kind of like that kid that just had to have the He-Man Castle Grayskull. You know what talk about? $147 in 1986. <laughs> not saying it's a true story or anything. But let's just say, hypothetically, that they buy that, and you're so excited, you open it, but by the end of the night, you're not even playing with that. You're playing with the box. You're building a fort with a 37-cent box. What do we do? Our eyes start to look to and fro for that next gleamy thing, that next trinket, that next thing that we just have to have. And we go, we get it, and sure enough, we think we can recapture that moment of joy, but it falls short again. So we do it again. I mean, what is wrong with us? Now, I understand if a seven-year-old does that. But what about us 47 and 57 and 77-year-old? We keep falling for the same lie. We think buying that one thing is going to be that easy fix. There's just one problem. It is so fleeting that it just does this over and over, and it's not a sustainable cycle. And once that temporary rush, that temporary joy fades, the truth is we are left holding the empty bag or the box, or the empty blue Tiffany jewelry box. And we think, well, I don't know. I've just read about that. I've never had enough money to buy that, but I've heard it's impressive. And we look down, and we think, what is going on? There are so, now here, here's the funny part, but it's also sad. There are so many people today who feel the pull for new stuff. They don't even have room to let go of the old stuff. You know what I'm talking about? People are literally drowning in stuff. This is a picture of my son's bedroom. <laughs> this right here. This, this is representing so much. Y'all, do you know what we do? Think about this. Okay, I want you to think how, how sick this is in our overly blessed country. We don't have room for our stuff, yet we buy more stuff. So we go and pay more money to rent a storage stuff place. And we forget that there's stuff in there. Y'all know? There are TV shows about this where they go and they, people have forgotten about their stuff that they're paying for. They stop paying rent. And so they cut the locks off and they sell their stuff to you. And people actually line up for this. Like, I don't have enough stuff. I'm going to go buy somebody else's stuff. Sight unseen. Can't go in the locker. Oh, no, no. You'll be excommunicated from the club. Can't touch the stuff. You just got to buy it. Sight unseen. Y'all, there are so many storage places they are popping up on every corner. They're like mattress warehouse shops. They're everywhere. And I don't understand who's buying all these mattresses. And I don't understand who's filling these lockers with stuff. I did some research on this. Are you ready for a fact? This is crazy. If we took all the storage facilities and put them side by side in the U.S., they would, this is amazing, they would fill a space 83 square miles. Well, that's the size of Las Vegas. <laughs> stuff. Stuff we don't even need. And we think about these material things and how much they distract us. It is this crazy cycle, but here's the problem. It not only hurts us, it can hurt our career, it can hurt our kids, it can hurt our marriages, it 
and hurt our testimony. But more importantly, it strangles us and it takes that margin away from us. And we're not able to do anything for God. We're not able to do anything for the kingdom. And Jesus shows up, and in Matthew chapter 6, he warns us against this behavior. Check it out with me. He says, don't store up your stuff, my word, here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them, where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasure in heaven where moths and rust can't destroy, where thieves don't break in and steal. For wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be. And I don't know about you, I don't want my heart being trapped in somebody's stinky self-storage locker, being auctioned off to the highest bidder. But that's what we, we do. It's crazy. We do this more in this country than anyone. This is why we are in this series called Making Space, where we want to make space to discover the keys in our finances. We can live the lives God is calling us to be. It is so hard to make space, though, if we are constantly bringing more stuff into our world into our room. Remember last week, we looked at some of the keys to this, one of the ways to have more financial space. The first thing we have to understand is this key foundational truth. Everything I have belongs to God. Everything. Our clothes, the job he gives us to earn the money, our food, our toys, our trinkets, our knickknacks, our tchotchkes, our Netflix. Hmm. Some of the stuff we watch on that, maybe God doesn't want to own that. Did he go there? What? The very next breath we breathe. The fact that your heart is pumped. He owns it all. Not just the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns it all. Everything I have is a gift from God. Do we know that? Once we learn that, we move to the next truth. God wants me to be a good manager of everything he's given us. Everything. When we take the ownership responsibility off our shoulders and we put it where it belongs on God, we realize we're just the stewards. We don't have to be the owner. We're not the landlord. We're the tenant. And he gives us these things. And here's the great news, the third point. God will reward good managers. This should make you excited. Not only will he reward you in this life, but he will reward you in the next. We see that we'll actually have positions and authority. And he says, you will reign with me. We forget about the millennial reign. We forget about the kingdom to come, the new heavens and the new earth. We think when we die, we become Casper and float around on a cloud and play a harp. We don't do that. That's what Satan tries to paint a picture so it loses its luster. We don't live for the kingdom. But it is not going to be like that at all. You will be rewarded for your faithful stewardship right now. You are on the clock. That's awesome. Well, it should terrify us, but it should excite us at the same time. That is incredible. This week, we're going to dive a little deeper, and I want to ask you another question. Do I really need stuff to make me content? So we're driving towards contentment. Do I really need stuff to make me happy, to make me content? And if so, then let me ask you another question. How much stuff do you really need before you say, oh, here's the line, not yet, not yet, not happy, not good. Now I'm content. Here I am. I made it. Where's that line? Because if you're honest, the line keeps moving. It keeps shifting. It's like a mirage. It'll never be enough. You're going to see some amazing quotes from some people who you think have it made. And when they open up their heart and they reveal a little bit, it is mind-blowing. Y'all, we have an epidemic in our culture. I'm not talking about the coronavirus. I'm talking about stuffitis. I'm talking about affluenza. I'm talking about consumeritis where we shop and we buy stuff, stuff we don't even need. But I have good news. You know I always bring the good news with the harsh reality here. God has provided an off-ramp off the crazy train. God has provided an off-ramp to get off this crazy cycle of consumerism. And Paul hits it on the head. Look with me at the contentment passage, Philippians chapter 4. He says this, I know what it is to be in need. And I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether I'm well-fed or hungry, whether I'm living in plenty or I'm in want. Oh, that's incredible. Talk about maturity. Think about, do you know the Greek word for content is also translated three different ways? Listen to these words. I want you to apply them to your life. Paul says, I have learned the secret. The word is translated as sufficient or adequate or, and I love this one, satisfied. Now be honest. 
just you and the Lord. Are you satisfied? Are you living a life fully centered and satisfied with what God has given you? See, here's, here's the major truth. What Paul is saying, and this, I know this is going deep really fast. This one's going to sting a little, okay? I'm giving you a heads up as your friendly neighborhood pastor. This one's going to sting a little. Paul is saying that Christian contentment is the ability to be satisfied with God's loving provision in any and every situation you're in. How you doing with that? Man, that, is, that hits me right between the eyes when I complain and say, God, why are you doing this? How come we don't have this? Why are we sure here? How come the church is struggling for this? What, what is it? Paul learned this secret. He said the secret, if you are a Christian, is to walk in a daily knowledge of satisfied in front of the Lord that his loving provision is exactly what you need. Because he promised that. He said, look at the flowers. Look at the lilies. Look at all these things, man. They, they don't freak out and worry about these things. You know who does that? The pagans, the lost people. My children who know me, man, we're not supposed to chase after those things. We're not supposed to have to worry about that. We're not supposed to have a worry line here, those deep frown things, because we're stressed out about that. Paul learned the secret. Contentment is a learned skill. This is awesome. This just gives me hope. That means you're not born with it. You can't go, well, I'm just not a content person. The glass is always half empty. No, 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 no. Come tram, mon frere. You get to learn this. This is a skill. I'm going to tell you something here. This is shocking, okay? It's a shocking statement. Our culture does not celebrate contentment. <laughs> Do you know that? In fact, the culture pushes just the opposite. They don't want you to be content. Every commercial you see, every annoying autoplay ad on YouTube, everything you see popping up on your Instagram feed or on your Facebook is designed to tell you you are discontent. And you will find contempt. This is so twisted. You will only be content if you buy their thing. Did you, did you catch that? You are discontent. You're not content, but if you have my product, oh, then you'll be content. It goes around. If you just buy their stuff, their product, now you will have the promise of, of, of contentment. And we have been bought this lie. We, we buy into this that our value comes from the stuff we have or the, the people we know, that life's about me. And it, it is so countercultural to be a Christian today to know our value doesn't matter from what we earn. It doesn't come from how many hours we put, how much stuff, how flamboyant our vacay picks are off on the gram. It's none of that. Our value comes from God. He is so much more concerned, not with our status, but with the heart, the way we live our lives with godly contentment. And Paul says, I've learned the secret of that. So what's his secret? What is Paul's secret? Come back next week and I will tell you. I'm just kidding. I won't do that to you. God has showed Paul something here and it is amazing. How do you do this? There are three mental shifts we can embrace to move into a life of true contentment. The first one is this, and it's a doozy. Refuse to trade self for stuff. If you're a note taker, you're going to want that one. Refuse to trade self for stuff. Jesus was asked, actually asked a very powerful question. He comes up and he asks this incredible question about relationship to stuff. He says, what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but you lose your soul? Of course we have certain needs that have to be met. Of course there comes a point where everything has to be provided for. But sometimes you cross a line where your happiness no longer increases with the stuff. Or even with the money. As we gain more, our concept of what a need suddenly begins to shift. And this is so insidious. It's like the evil emperor in Star Wars who's kind of manipulating behind the scenes. You don't even know it's happening. See, what used to be a want, a luxury, one day maybe we could have that, when we had a little now somehow becomes a need. And it's insidious. It creeps up. It happens. So what is it that's driving these needs? Is it the fact that you are trying to live for somebody else? Is it your parents? They wanted you to go have this job, learn this career. Is, is it your spouse? Is it teachers? Is it, who is putting pressure on you to be successful in their eyes? What is it that is making us... Back in middle school, we fell for this. When we didn't have the cool shoes... We couldn't sit at the cool table because we didn't bring enough Oreos to bribe our friends and we were made fun of and we were mocked. And I'm thinking, where did this lie come from? And then it hit me. We have given into envy and unhealthy ambition where money and possessions and things are away now. We feel like we can prove we're hashtag winning, right? But here is the truth. As long as you confuse your self-worth with your net worth, you will always be disappointed. Always. 
As long as you confuse your self-worth with your net worth, you are going to be chasing the next dollar. And it is a brutal and a tiring way to live. And you know somebody who's trapped on that. Here's the latest stats I found. This is, this is incredible to me. The majority of Americans now spend 100% of what they make plus 3% more. <laughs> it's finance. It's in debt. 103% thanks to people who do not have your best interest at heart like the Lord does. Always chasing stuff, material things, and they're hurting people's marriages. Spending habits are what couples say is the leading reason for divorce now. Think about that. The average American works 47 hours a week. That extra time is time that is away from your family. It is away taking you away from enjoying your relationship with God. It takes you away from serving in your church or your communities. And doctors say 75% of the symptoms are brought on by stress. Man, that is a high cost. Y'all, that is no way to live for the believer. That is not wise. We choose to walk in the, the counsel of the holy and the wise. The wisest man who ever lived wrote this. Look at Ecclesiastes 4. He says, then I observe that most people are motivated to success because they envy their neighbors. But this too is meaningless. It's like chasing the wind. Now oh, that's powerful. What a, this is the guy who had the most money in history and the most wisdom. And it's good to provide for your family. There's nothing wrong with working hard. He tells us to do that. But there is such a huge difference between working and wearing yourself out, chasing the wind, where you're never satisfied. What motivates us to work and what priority we give work is so critical. God wants us to have equal measure of rewarding hard work, which is good, and an equal measure of contentment and peace. So how are you doing with that? If you had to rate yourself today, where are you on this scale? In fact, let me ask this probing question. Why do you really do what you do for your livelihood, for your job? Why do you really do what you do, what you work at? Why do you put in so much time? Let's do a, a little fun self-evaluation. We did one last week, and I want to do one this, okay? If you find yourself where your paycheck never seems to go far enough, or you find yourself where the work never seems to end, or you find yourself where you are caught in a cycle of just consuming and buying and bor borrowing and coming back and consuming more, then ask this first question. What is the most important thing in my life? You have to know that. You have to be able to answer that. What is the most important thing in my life? Then move to question two. How does what I'm devoting my time to align with that? And do I find joy in what I'm doing? Is my work balanced with an even measure of contentment and peace? And if you find you don't like the answers to any of those questions, great. You're in the right place on the right day. It's time for a change. Now we start thinking about what motivates us to go to these jobs. And we start to prioritize, according to what God says is most important, the most important things in our lives. Maybe that's doing less overtime now so you can spend more face time with the family. Maybe the kids don't need a new pair of sneakers as much as they need mom or dad. Maybe it's, maybe it's a reprioritizing. Maybe it's creating enough margin and space in your life so you can actually serve others. Maybe you can volunteer in the nursery once a week. I worked it in. Woo. <laughs> maybe, you know what, let's, let's just take a, a modern day example, okay? One of the greatest time stealers that we face today is something our parents didn't face. Not like this. One of the greatest time stealers, and I might add money leaks, is our entertainment consumption. This is incredible. I did some stat research on this. Maybe, in creative, maybe we can create a little space by let's just tackle one thing. This is just one, one idea, our subscriptions. <laughs> All right? How much does each subscription affect the quality of your life? I want you to look at these questions. And how often does your family really use it? Okay, this is just one simple example. Is there something free that you could replace one of your paid subscriptions with? How much extra money could you save if you chose to let one or two or four or five go? What would you do with that extra money? How would you feel if you canceled several subscriptions? Would that allow you more financial space to do something that honors God? Because you're being watched for your financial stewardship. Hear me. You will be rewarded for this time. This isn't the dress rehearsal. This is the show. 
Curtains open. You're on. So how you doing? Because he is aware of this. And maybe we can create some more financial space and do something that honors the Lord that will outlive us, that actually moths don't get to and thieves don't steal. Maybe it'll allow you to set up a regular contribution to some ministry that you have near and dear to your heart. If you don't have one, might I suggest your church? How about that? There's so many awesome things out there that a lot of good people are trapped like this because of poor decisions we made, and they can't. If God calls them to help a brother out, I can't because I've blown everything on myself. God spanked me about that many years ago, and it changed everything. There is nothing more rewarding than being able to surprise somebody or see some guy who comes in off the street, sit down at the table, and you call the waiter over and you say, that's on me. Don't tell them. And I bless them. Oh, yeah, they come in once a week. And you can do that, and it's no strings attached love. Hear me, church. We are never more like Jesus than when we're giving. It's what he did. For God so loved the world, he what? Gave. It's the very first thing. So the first thing, we need to tr refuse to trade who we are for stuff. The next step, the next mental shift is about what drives you. What is your motivation? In other words, use money. Don't chase it. Don't serve it. It's supposed to serve you. Let me ask you this question. How many have ever heard the phrase, money is the root of all evil? You ever heard that? That's not exactly what the Bible says. Did you know that? That is a gross misquoting of it. Like God helps those who help themselves. That's not even in the scripture. In fact, the way you read the Bible, it should say God helps those who can't help themselves. That is not what the verse says. Look with me very specifically what the verse says. It says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. That is drastically different than money is the root of all evil. And so many people who have chased after this have pierced themselves with so many sorrows. The Bible says it's the love of money. But money itself isn't the problem. God's not anti-money. God loves to bless you with that. He knows having money can help you take care of your family, your needs, and bless others with it. There's nothing wrong with making money. What God is concerned about is not us having it, but it having us. Where you are wrapped up in this. The problem is the love of money. God doesn't want us to be that guy. We all know that person who's done some stupid stuff because he's so blinded by his love for money that he goes off the cliff. We have family members like that. You do too. Where they're so blinded by it, they're making silly decisions. God is saying, don't fall in love with money. Rick Warren puts it like this. I love it. He says, your yearning power will always exceed your earning power. Man, that is so good. You will always want to yearn for more. It'll never be enough. How powerful. Money promises so much, but it seldom delivers. I think of it like a, like a little evil Keebler elf. And he's got these cookies. And you can smell them, and you want them. But when you get up to them, you realize they were like cardboard. They're like, oh, no, I don't have real cookies. I don't know, what, what, what do you want? And he's like this evil elf that pulls it back, and he promised me all that. Like he would magically fix my problems if I came and had some of his cookies and chased after him. And when I get to him, I realize, you lied to me. You little evil Keebler elf. <laughs> Who does that? And you look and you think, oh my goodness, I was chasing the wind. This is what Ecclesiastes was talking about. I was chasing the wind. John D. Rockefeller, one of the wealthiest men who ever lived, was asked this question. How much will it take for you to be happy? How much does it take for a man to be happy? And his response is so revealing. Just one dollar more. It's never enough. Just one dollar. Always one more. How sad. And we're bombarded with this, these messages and these ads every day that subtly and not so subtly tell us, if you just had a little bit more, then you'd be happy. But if that were true, then the wealthiest people in the world would also be the happiest people in the world. And that's not true. If you've ever met some, you know they have insecurity and fear. and They put their trust in something that doesn't last, and they're just as miserable as people who have no money. Money doesn't buy that. In fact, Jim Carrey, we see this with celebrity, he had this great statement a couple years ago. I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see it's not the answer. Having money doesn't bring contentment or peace. Well, pastor, if I'm honest, I'd like to try. <laughs> I'd love it if I could try. I mean, at least I would feel secure, right? Would you? Maybe for a time, perhaps. But money isn't eternal. 
Just look, look at your 401k. One illness, one virus, one economic downturn, and it can vaporize. If that's where you put your trust, you will be destroyed. You can't do that. I grew up watching Marvin the Martian. Anybody remember Marvin the Martian? Oh, heavens to try my space modulator, right? He, he was so funny to me because he had this disintegrator gun. And anytime I think about wealth vaporizing, I picture this, this Martian always turning the gun back on himself somehow, and he's always, at the end of the, the episode, he poofs himself into a disintegrated pile of ashes. Poof. Oh, no. And I, I'm just like, this guy will never learn. And I realized, no, this is exactly what we do when we put our trust in money. It can disintegrate. Every promotion at work, every raise we finally achieve, every purchase we are finally thinking we're trying to make, and then as soon as we get it, we quickly replace that with something else that's always just out of grasp, always just beyond reach, and it is a cycle that is sick. And for God's people, that is not supposed to be us. We're better than that. He's called us to break free from that bondage. So you know i got to ask, how are you doing with that? Are you in chains? It's okay. There's a way out. Jesus came to break that. As followers of Christ, we cannot let money be our God. We can't be falling in love with it. We can't give it that kind of power over our life. Yes, God wants us to work hard. We talked about it last week. He wants us to be responsible with what we have. We talked about it last week. But when we start to think that if we just had X amount, if we just owned this thing, we start thinking that it's some magical silver bullet that will fix our problems, we will be disappointed time and time again. What God doesn't want us is to put more faith in money than we do in him because it will always evaporate. It will always leave us disappointed and wanting more. Let me show you a real life example, the perfect example. I'm just so excited to share this with you. Raise your hand if you've ever been to Disney World or Disneyland. Okay, most, has anyone been to Euro Disney? Really? Wow, real fans, that's awesome. Do you know that at every Disney World park, they have a main street? As you come in, you will see this beautiful, beautiful bakery, usually on the right side. And as you walk by that bakery, you smell the most incredible chocolate chip cookies. You smell them right now, aren't you? I am. And they make you hungry. And you turn in, and you go buy one or two or a dozen. And you eat them, not confessing, just saying hypothetically. And you go into this store, and you are overwhelmed by this incredible scent, and you buy on impulse. You weren't even hungry, but you go in and do it. What if I told you you are not really smelling cookies? It's a fake. They have a scent, a cookie scent, that is literally pumped out by machines through vents on each side of the store into the street to waft down Main Street to lure you in like a field of petunias, and you show up wanting cookies. There's just one problem. On one particular day at Disney World, the ovens broke. <laughs> you get to your ahead of me. The ovens broke, and they had to shut them down until they could be repaired. Just one problem. I forgot to send the memo to the tech guy to turn off the scent wafting down the street. So hapless Guests paying a lot of money walking down Main Street. Cookies. <laughs> Smelled it. And like zombies, turned into the store. Imagine their shock when they go up to the counter and they say, I want some of them cookies I'm smelling. They say, oh, oh, we don't have any cookies. And they say, yeah, you do, because we smell them. See where this is going? And they say, no, sir, we don't. The shelf is bare. And they say, I smell the cookies. I want the cookies. Y'all, they started to get angry. They started, you know why? Because now they were desperate. Because they had set up their ex, oh, this is so good. They set up their expectation, and they had already <laughs> reeling them in, and they discussed reality that wasn't even true. You have cookies, and I want to buy them. Where are you hiding them? We want these. And they became desperate, and they wanted them even more. Y'all, the false promises of money are just like that. We do the same thing. They seem so tangible, and right as we think we're going to get them, they don't materialize. And we just got reeled in yet again. We're better than that. 
In the end, it was all just an illusion. So the first mental shift to breaking free of this is avoiding trading self for stuff. The second mental shift is to avoid chasing these false promises of money. They don't deliver. The last one is probably the most important. Write it down. Enjoy what I have. Enjoy what God's given you. Don't miss this. Appreciation for what we have, what God has already provided, is so important to controlling the desire and the pull of more. This ability to enjoy what we already have is actually a gift from God, and he wants you to use it. Look at Ecclesiastes 5.19. He says, it is a good thing to receive wealth from God and the good help to enjoy it, to enjoy your work and to accept your lot in life. This is indeed a gift from God. And this sounds so simple, but it's so difficult and surprisingly difficult for us in a blessed, fat, happy, and content society that we live in. Y'all, we are so driven to achieve the next thing that we fail to appreciate what God has put in our hands. This is crazy. You ever know somebody who's always saving that special thing for the special occasion just around the corner? You know what I'm talking about? Maybe somebody's giving you a gift that is so precious, so dear, so expensive, or so incredible that you're afraid to use it. So what do you do? You put it in a box, and you put it in the back of your closet. Or you put it on a shelf in your garage, and you forget about it. Just waiting for that perfect time that never comes. And then, guess what? Sometimes you go back and you discover, oh my goodness, the time has passed to use it. And now you can't even use it properly with the way it was intended. Y'all, we do this all the time. We blow it, the chance to pop. The perfect opportunity is now to appreciate what God has given us. The fact that you are here today with air in your lungs, with a beating heart, sitting next to people who are able to have a hot shower, people who are able to buy clothes. Isn't it awesome? None of us are here naked. We're able to sit here and enjoy being in a free country where we can worship God. The fact that we can buy the clothes on our backs. How many people take that for granted? This is incredible. Y'all, growing up, we had one of these fancy rooms. I don't know if you have one of these, a dining room. <laughs> oh, yes, you got to love the 60s. <laughs> Anybody grow up with a grandma that had one of these? Do you remember what would happen if you came to the threshold of that room? They had an alarm somehow embedded in their mind <laughs> where that head would snap around and say, what are you doing, Eli? Get away, right? And they would call you out. I just have to look at not Eli directly, but they would call you out. It was almost like they had like a, like a trip wire. You, what? I didn't go in the room. Don't even look in the room. What are you doing? Why are you breathing in that direction? Come away. They protected that room. Y'all know what? We never used that room. When we got married, one of the things they said, you got to have fine china and everyday china. You need to go register for thousands of dollars to find. Y'all, we never used the fine china. I don't even think we have it anymore. We probably gave it away for pennies on the dollar. But we had to have it. <laughs> Do you see how ubiquitous this is? Y'all, it is everywhere. Enjoy what we have. How crazy is this? God doesn't want us to treat the good things he's given us and live this way, where we put it in a box and we fail to use it. He wants us to recognize them, to thank him, to appreciate them, and to enjoy them. Stop waiting for the right time for you to be content. Hear me, Christian. We should be the most content people on the planet. We know the Savior. Not about this stuff. We know it's all going to be renovated with a holy fire. It's all going to burn. He's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. What do we do? So how do we tap into the gift of contentment? One word. Gratitude. Powerful word. Gratitude. I hope you are teaching your children this. This is so powerful. This changes our hearts from always wanting the next thing to focusing on what is right in front of us. And when you do that, it drains the power out of greed. It sucks out the, the allure out of envy. And it gives us a new joy and an appreciation for what is already in front of us. So you think, Pastor, that sounds good. How do I do that practically? First thing you do is you talk to the Lord about it. The first thing you say, Lord, would you help me be content? Pray and ask the Lord for help. Ask him to help you enjoy everything he's given you. The second thing you do is you move to gratitude. You begin to thank him for every good thing in your life. Thank him that you woke up today. 
Thank him that you were able to get here, that you're able to be around people, that you have food to eat, that you're sitting next to friends beside you. Maybe you're a journaler. Start a gratitude entry where you start listing all the things that you are thankful for every day. And if this is hard for you, and you kind of know that you, you kind of tend to be a little more on the negative side, maybe you see things, the glass half empty, and you know that about yourself, that's awesome. Get a friend to challenge you, to be accountable and say, listen, would you help me not be the negative nanny all the time? Would you, would you help me see the positive in this? Would you help me count my blessings and let them be that one that start each conversation with something you're grateful for? Do you know you can literally reprogram your mind to have an attitude of gratitude instead of an attitude of entitlement? Do you know you can do that? You can literally read at the end of the night, get your family together, start thinking of the specific things you are grateful to God for and thank them. Y'all, we do this every night with our kids. It is awesome. Rather than just say, hey, what was the highlight of your day? We say, what are you thankful for? You will laugh so hard sometimes, and sometimes it'll bring a tear to your eye when you hear what a child is grateful for. You hear from the words of a three-year-old. Mm. And it pierces your heart when you think of the stupid stuff we complain about. You say, God, forgive me. Thank you for reminding me through a child what I have to be grateful for, what I have to be thankful for. You've given me another day. Lord, would you give me a heart of contentment and peace? Isn't that what we really want? There it is. Remember, God doesn't care and he doesn't mind with you having stuff. He just doesn't want the stuff to have you where you're in chains. He's instructed us to work hard. He's instructed us to be good stewards, good managers of it, and he wants that balanced with contentment in our heart. How are you doing with that? I'm going to have our band come up, and I want to ask you a quick question here. If you've ever had a dog, have you ever tried to give it a treat? What does the dog do with that treat? Yes, it scarfs it up right away, doesn't it? Like, home, and they don't even savor it. So what do we do? We get creative with the treat, and we say, let's try this. I'm going to make the dog slow down and enjoy this. I'm going to put the treat right on his nose. Oh, don't act like you haven't done this. You know, don't, oh, for shit, it's not my dog. You put the treat on the nose. You say, wait, wait, wait. And he's sitting there looking at a little drool. Say, okay, now, and before it hits the ground, the dog goes, home, oh, like, a, like a ninja, grabs the cookie out of the air in slow motion and eats the treat, and still doesn't savor it at all. Y'all, it doesn't matter how many treats, you could stack several on the dog's nose and say, I want you to appreciate it. And they will scarf it down, and then they will have the audacity to look at you for more. Now, we don't ever do this. We just inhale it. All the blessings got to do it. We don't stop to enjoy it and appreciate it. Y'all, you could stack 50 treats on a dog's nose, and it wouldn't change it. We take zero time to savor and enjoy the treat of what God has given us today. So here's my challenge for you today. Does God want you to live a better way? Every moment of our lives is a gift from God, and he gives it to enjoy. What is he talking to you right now in your heart that you need to change, that you need to give to him? God's here. He's speaking. Let's pray about it. Lord, I thank you for the power of your word. Lord, would you give us a heart of contentment? Help us to stop chasing the wind, to be splashing around in the kiddie pool when you have a giant ocean behind us. God, help us to go into the deep waters of your love and joy and peace and contentment and to be an example for so many that are looking for it. Forgive us for the times, Lord, that we should have been your best ambassadors. And we were just like the crowd. God, you called us to better than that. Help us to be faithful, to chase after you, not chase after the wind. Lord, break our hearts. Chisel through the stony, cold walls of indifference that we put up, maybe subtly, maybe brick by brick. We didn't even know it was there, but God, would you invade our space? Help us to create more margin that we can work with you, that you can use us as a tool in your hand. 
So God, whatever it is today, Lord, beginning with us, not beginning out there with the lost, beginning with us, with people who wear your name, who call ourselves believers, Lord, would you change us and make us more like Jesus, who never once chased after things. God, help our priorities to be right. We ask this in your powerful name. Amen.